we started our show. Matter of fact, it was called Pull Over Neighbor, mm -hmm. and it was on the coast, and it started in June 5th, 1938, here on the Pacific Coast on NBC. And Edward's show started in 1940, coast to coast. Mm -hmm. So we started two years earlier, but he was on coast to coast before. And ah. we didn't use the title People Are Funny until 1942. So Art Baker was the uh -huh. MC for Full Over Neighbor for two and a half years. Then he was the MC for All Aboard for six months. And then the show was off the air and couldn't sell it. But <clears throat> there was an advertising club luncheon, oh, uh, somewhere in 1940, I guess it was. And I was sitting down at the table at the Biltmore Hotel and uh, there were some pretty important executives around there, the president of the uh, Richfield Oil Company and the head of a bank and so forth in the, mm -hmm. one of the front tables. And I was looking at them and they were all drawing pictures on the table, doodling, you know, one draws sailor, one draws stars, and one draws some wheat, a tree. And the man on the stage was making a pretty dull speech, you know, he was, mm -hmm. you know, was just talking there. And so I wrote down a comment about what was going on. I wrote, people are funny. Just the phrase, people are uh -huh. funny, as a comment. I made it lots of letters and big, thick letters, you know, made it look like the 20th Century Fox, you uh -huh. know, the, the, the <laughs> logo. And I thought, well, there's a theme for a program, human nature, proving that people are funny. People Are Funny debuted on April 10th, 1942 on NBC. It was created by game show maven John Goodell. He was a jack of all trades who'd spent time as a WPA ditch digger, a traveling salesman, and a collector of his own rejection slips. About a year went by, and I read in the paper in March 1942, that's right after the war started, the Daily Variety had a front page story saying that the government gave the Brown and Williamson Tobacco Company one week to get a program off the air, and not even one more broadcast because it was called Captain Flag and Sergeant Quirk, and that's a funny show. And they did not, during wartime, want to show or depict army officers fraternizing with enlisted men. Well, I'd been writing letters to everybody, and so I took this yellow sheet of paper and wrote, I have the answer to your problem, and sent it to the man's name of the agency, Russell uh, Tom Wallace. The Russell Seeds Agency in Chicago was mentioned in the article mm -hmm. as being involved. I didn't feel I could afford to send a telegram because I sent out so many letters I saying I have the answer to your problem that I just sent letters, you know. So apparently they did have a quick problem, so they sent a wire back, what is it? And I sent them the record. And they got it on Wednesday. They said, how much do you want for it? And I said, we want $5,000 a week. And they said, we'll offer you $750. And I said, well, there's some... That's your rock top. <laughs> and uh, we argued a bit and ended up at $750 for four weeks. And we went on two days later. You see, we had to go on that Friday. We didn't see any of the people back east. They had live radio time coming Ready up Friday go, at yeah. 6 o'clock yeah. on NBC and what's going to fill it. So they had this high-class $750 program called The hmm. People Are Funny. It was fair. Well, did you do that now with two Both MCs. MCs. Both, Both MCs. MCs. By the fall of 1943, Goodell had negotiated a large raise and made Art Linkletter the sole MC. In those days, our prizes were very small. The entire production was almost nothing, and it was exciting. It was experimentation. What'll work, what won't work. And the shows evolved naturally from the simple questions and answers of who are you and where are you from and what are you doing to can you spell, do you know uh, who was buried in Grant's tomb, <laughs> and other kinds of questions. And then the first real audience participation stunt show was John Goodell and myself originating People Are Funny at about the same time that Ralph Edwards came up with a similar kind of a show called Truth or Consequences. People Are Funny became a Friday night staple throughout the 1940s. In addition, Goodell would create House Party and You Bet Your Life. How much of the People Are Funny and House Party shows were actually scripted? Or were they outlined, outlines, perhaps? Or? Just the material I needed, for instance, to know uh, where we were going and what the prizes were going to be and what the real gist of the show was, whether it was uh, 
sending a person on a wild goose chase somewhere or dressing him up and putting him into a situation or inciting a fight in the audience between an actor and then getting witnesses who were just seated around there at random and what they saw and what really happened. Whatever it was, I just had the uh, outline and we'd talk it through and since I was also a writer and associate producer on the show, I knew the show thoroughly by the time I walked out there. By January of 1954, People Are Funny was airing on CBS Tuesday nights at 8 p.m. for Mars Candy. With a rating of 8.4, it was radio's top-rated show. This is audio from the January 5th episode. Who is the better loser, a man or a woman? It all depends on what they lose on People Are Funny. Yes, transcribed from Hollywood, John Goodell's production of People Are Funny, brought to you by Forever Yours and Milky Way Candy Bars, both quality bars made famous by Mars. And now here's radio's top master of ceremonies, Art Linkletter. Hello there, everybody. Well, here it is, a brand new year, our first broadcast of the new year. And guess what? I've made a resolution to be kind, courteous, and considerate to every contestant on People Are Funny through the whole year. Well, Roy Rowan, who's first to prove that I can't keep a resolution? Mr. Robert Jeffrey from Meriden, Connecticut. Meet Art Linkletter. How do you do, Mr. Jeffrey? How do you do, Mr. Linkletter? Did he say Meriden, Connecticut? That's right, Meriden. Well, that's the magic word. You win a big box of dark chocolate goodness, 24 Forever Yours candy bars. What do you do back there? I work for International Silver Company. You're married, man, aren't you? Yes, I am. Mm-hmm. You know, we give away some nice prizes on this show. Yes, I know you do. How would you like to win? A 1954 Hudson Jet with Hudson's instant action super induction engine. Yeah, I would. Uh-huh. Well, Mr. Jeffrey, I'm happy to be able to tell you that you are the only person who can't win it. <laughs> Because this one's an outside stunt for our listeners only. Look at that. Only one minute of the broadcast, and I've already broken my resolution to be kind to contestants. <laughs> well, anyway, it's better to give than receive. Don't you think so? Yes, I do. I hope you believe that. Because, Mr. Jeffrey, your stunt tonight is to make somebody happy by giving them a gift. Now, this is what's going to happen. You're going to leave CBS and be driven out into Hollywood to a residential neighborhood. You're going to pick out any house. That's up to you. You just say, that one right there. We stop the car and you get out and you walk up. Be sure you notice the number of the street and everything because when somebody answers the door, you tell them that you live at the same number, two blocks over, and that you got a Christmas present, you unwrapped it, and then you saw by the card inside that it was not for you and that you were bringing it over to them. You got that? Yes, I've got that. All right, now... Then you come over and you hand the person this beautiful antique lamp like this. Here, take it. You dropped it. You dropped it. Yeah, I dropped it, didn't I? Yes, you did. This is what we want you to do, see? I have some more lamps, like oh, this one. Well, now, you're, you're going to have them in the back of the car. And you're going to take one of the lamps at a time. And you're going to go up to these doors, see? And you're going to say what I told you, that you've got the present. And as they reach out for the lamp, you drop it, just like I did. And it smashes into bits right on the porch in front of them. In other words, there are two basic uh, emotions inside the mind of this person at the door. They're happy and grateful to you for being honest enough to bring their present over. And then they're madder and heck because you just busted it in front of them. <laughs> now, the question is, will they bust you? <laughs> I think this is going to be an interesting experiment. We want you to take down, as long as you last... The, the various comments and the reactions of what they do, and then come back and report on how the people reacted when the late Christmas present arrived. Say goodbye to them, audience. <laughs> uh, who's next, Roy? Mr. and Mrs. George Cannon from Fairbanks, Alaska. Art, but they're waiting off stage. Oh, yes, they're the newlyweds. And down through the last 13 years, some of our very finest guests on this program have been newlyweds. You know why? Newlyweds are a little more self-conscious, a little more easily embarrassed, a little more nervous than anybody else. Now, what we're going to find out tonight is how much Mrs. Cannon, the wife, one of our newlyweds, will sacrifice to keep her husband from doing a very embarrassing thing. Now, 
We'll give them a test. You'll find out what it is as it goes along. And at a certain point, if she will save him from embarrassment at considerable sacrifice to her own self, we're going to give her a surprise gift that she doesn't know anything about. A beautiful tap and gas range for their new home. All right, boys, bring them out and watch what happens. Because, remember, this is just a test. They don't know what we're, what's, what's going on as yet. And our, our next couple is coming here now, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Cannon. Oh, hello. How do you do, George? Where are you from, George? Fairbanks, Alaska. Oh, the ice is broken up early this winter. <laughs> what, do, what, what, what do you do up there? I have the photo finishing concession at Ladd Air Force Base and photography. Uh-huh. And Mrs. Cannon? I work for the Ladd Air Force Base with Controller's Office. How long have you been married? 17 days, 23 hours, and 15 minutes. <laughs> I'd say that you're in your uh, late 30s. A little later than that, Art. Uh-huh. <laughs> what kept you? Why did you wait so long to get married, George? I had to find a good girl. How'd you find her? What was she doing when you found her? I called a friend of mine to ask her if she would like to go with me to Officers Club at Candlelight and Wine, and she said that she was busy, but there was a nice gal that came in that she had known in Tokyo. She thought that she would like to go. Ah, and you uh, made a blind date with him? It's a good one, too. Yes. Well, now, uh, you're going to go back to Alaska? A week from tomorrow. Yes. I feel sentimental when I talk to newlyweds. I'd like to do something nice for you, Mrs. Cannon. Thank you. How would you like a few nice additions to your wardrobe, for instance? Mm, I'd love that. All right. I'm going to make it easy for you. You're just going to answer a few simple questions and a little quiz. And for every correct answer you give me, I'll add something nice to your wardrobe. How does that sound? Well, thank you. That's wonderful. Uh -huh. Mr. Cannon, does this sound like a good deal to you? Sounds fine. Well, I'm glad you agree because the other part of the game goes this way. <laughs> Every time we add to her wardrobe, we subtract from yours. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> How does that sound? Not so good. You may think you're back in Alaska here in a couple of minutes. Uh, you remember that, Mrs. Cannon? Well, well, I'll show you how it works out. For instance, uh, what's your address up there? 821 Northwood Building, Fairbanks, Alaska. That is absolutely right. And you have just one for yourself, a pair of lovely lady shoes from Forever Yours. Well, thank you. Isn't that nice? Uh, oh, by the way, Mr. Cannon, the other half of the game, would you take your shoes off, please? <laughs> oh, get a load of those socks. All right, now that's the first part of the game. Now, uh... Mrs. Cannon, here's your next question. Do you know who was the second assistant secretary of the Navy? Mm, I don't know. That is correct. I asked you, do you know? You do not know. That is right. <laughs> For that, you get a lovely cashmere sweater. <laughs> well, Mr. Cannon, you don't have a cashmere sweater on, but you have a coat on. We're paralleling here, so we'll take his coat off. That's fine. <laughs> She's a pretty smart wife, huh? Yes, he is. Yeah. <laughs> now, Mrs. Cannon, for a new blouse, listen carefully. If Railroad A is 4,157 miles long and Railroad B is 2,237 miles long, which one is wider? Well, they're the same width. That is right. They are the same width. And you have just won a beautiful blouse. <laughs> We'd like to have your shirt, please, if you don't mind. <laughs> All right. Now we come to a very important question, Mrs. Cannon. Your next prize is a beautiful pair of slacks. <laughs> how, do you, how are you today, Mr. Cannon? Fine, Art. <laughs> what is the capital city of Illinois? Chicago. <laughs> You know something? Chicago is not the capital of Illinois. The capital of Illinois happened, does anybody know? Springfield. Springfield. Now, Mrs. Cannon, were you deliberately, did you know that? What, were we, what was going on? I don't know whether you're deliberately trying to avoid <laughs> winning these new slacks or whether you're not. Well, I tell you, you've only been married 17 days. Your husband is standing here with his pants on at the moment. <laughs> but he will lose them here in front of a thousand people if you answer this question correctly. Also, you'll get a $60 dress for yourself. <laughs> now, think these two alternatives over. You got a $60 dress or a husband without pants. <laughs> 
who was the first president of the United States? I don't know. Now, folks, just a minute. We don't want to make this too hard. I'm going to give you a hint. He was connected with a hatchet and a cherry tree. <laughs> You don't want to say, all right? Do you have any ideas? Go ahead, honey. Say Washington. <laughs> you want her to get the dress. You don't care about your pants. You let hers answer the question. You don't want to say? I don't know. Look at the dress. Look at the dress. Very beautiful dress. <laughs> Feel it. She's looking over at her husband. There's a nice feel to it. Silky. Uh -huh. What do you think? I don't remember. Up to her. Up to her. Mrs. Cannon, this was really a test to see whether or not you would, for a prize, let your husband be this embarrassed. Now, how about reversing the game now? Would you like to have some new clothes? Yes, I would, Art. <laughs> no, we're going to save that for television. Ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I'm just kidding, and I'm not kidding about this, Mrs. Cannon, because you were a real nice, modest bride, and you did save your husband from embarrassment, even though he wanted you to have the dress, figuring he'd save himself 60 bucks. <laughs> we're going to give you a surprise prize, a beautiful Tappan gas range for your home with the exclusive Tappan oh, features. Isn't that wonderful. nice? Wonderful. Good foods happen when you're cooking on a Tappan, whether you're in Alaska or in the Gulf of Mexico. And thanks for proving that people are funny. And don't forget to always make yours forever yours. And before the days when you could edit, I would imagine you probably had a pretty good time clock in your head so you knew how long very good. each should last. Very, very good. There's nobody can direct or produce a show that's running like that except really the person who's doing it. He has to sense not only the time, but how the show is going. And if you uh, cut it or uh, augment it by uh, things as the audience plays, you know, you're just playing against a wall like handball. When the audience reaction is great, you keep the thing going. And uh, everything that went wrong, you had to correct. There was no way of erasing it. If it was outrageous or unforgivable, you had to chide the person and correct him and apologize to the audience if he blurted out something wrong. Or you had to um, pretend that, uh, especially in radio, that something very good was happening, when actually not too much might be happening. I've given people a reunion with a long-lost son or brother or father on the program, and they just said, well, yeah, fine. And they look at you rather stoically. Then you have to augment that a little, let people say the, the reunion is very touching. So you had to prepare for the unexpected. Yes, and television made it even worse because you saw what you saw and you couldn't fool anybody. In the fall, People Are Funny moved to NBC. It aired there until June 10, 1960. When the TV version ended on April 1, 1960, the network aired encores for another year, making People Are Funny the first TV game show to be rerun. <laughs> 